Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. So welcome to the uh, semiconductor device and phases one. So uh, today we'll focus on the introduction. So it's a uh, uh, raining and windy day, but I'm glad to see that. Uh, I think we have uh, quite a lot of the uh, students here today uh, in this classroom. So we, uh, based on the times table, you will see the original classroom is in the ED. 552 or somewhere, but uh, uh, we prefer to change to this classroom or this one. And but uh, we uh, haven't fixed yet, so please uh, uh, make sure that you will receive my uh, notification for the future uh, classroom. Okay, so today we will focus on the introduction. Okay, so my name is uh, uh, Tianli Wu from the International College of the Semiconductor Technology. So first is uh, the course uh, descriptions here. So as you may know that uh, I think in the past like uh, one or two years uh, the, the shortage of the semiconductor chip that become like the, put the Taiwan in the main highlight in the whole world because we are contribute many, many semiconductor chips for the whole world, uh, different uh, system level uh, needed. And therefore, you, I believe so far you are pretty convinced that the semiconductor technology now is necessary to enable for the high performance electronics products here. So all of the product you have now, actually the core inside will be the semiconductor device technology here. So here are the two examples that actually everyone is using uh, every day that uh, I believe everyone cannot be uh, alive, cannot be survived without using the cell phone or laptop. Also for me as well. So for example, this is the Apple's A14 Bion uh, Bionic SOC consists of the 18 billion chips inside. 11.8 billion transistor. Transistor and is made using by the TSMC's uh, M5, which is a 5 nanometer <coughs> process technology here. So this is a one of the very an important example that how the, the semiconductor technology is important to continue for the uh, push for the very advanced CPU technology that enable for our cell phone to have the many amazing functions here. Another one that you might not aware of, but actually you already use every day here. So this is uh, the iPad charger. And the, the normally we call this charger, Chongdian Qi, but actually the real name, what we usually call is call this as an adapter. So the typical function for the adapter is like you try to uh, convert your electrical energy. For example, in Taiwan, we have the AC 100, 10 volt, and we try to convert the input voltage. So whatever the, the electricity you have, you must to connect for the, the adapter. So adapter is connect from the, for example here, this is adapter. And then you try to transform the energy from the AC 110 volt to the DC 1.5 volt. And this is typically, we call this as a converter. So the, the function for the adapter or the charger actually is just to convert the energy from the electronic supply or electronic planning to the one that we need for the voltage. For example, in the CPU, we only need for the 1.5 volt or even below one volt of our ele uh, electricity here. So therefore, we need to have this adapter that can help us to convert the energy here. 
So this is also very important electronic product. As you are maybe aware of that in the past one or two years, we start to have a certain innovation of this charger or adapter. Sometimes we call the face charger, which means we can charge our products in a more efficient way and in a fast way here. And that's because we replace some of the semiconductor device inside this charger here. So for example, this is a typical chip inside the PCB board inside of this adapter here. So inside this adapter, you can see this is a, a schematic for the circuit diagram that we needed for this uh, adapter here. And we can see there are many, many uh, different semiconductor device component and which we think is that's the most important one is, for example, we have this here. This is a transistor. And also, we have this one. It's called a dial here. And therefore, these are the all important semiconductor components that we will be a lecture in this class here. And in general, when we deal with uh, electric electrical energy conversion or the transportation and this kind of the uh, device or, or the circuit or system is we generally call this as a power electronics. And inside the power electronics, the most important uh, device is what we call the power semiconductor device. Okay, so this is, yes. I'm not familiar with the power electronics question. You say you are not familiar with it and you want to learn. Yes. Then you need to follow the class in the power electronics. Oh. There's a course called, generally called the power electronics. Is that necessary for this course? No, it's not necessary. It's uh, we just bring some application that you might use in the future, but in this class, we will still mainly focus on the device physics and uh, 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 device operations. Okay. So here is uh, uh, the trend for the technology development. So that's an industry roadmap that uh, we can see that there are some uh, from the early, like the 2005, until now for the 2020 or even 2021, we are still doing the many device innovation, trying to push for the technology uh, toward the more efficient and uh, also toward more low power. So in this case, I think you might already heard from the news that we have the 45 nanometer until now, we are actually have a five nanometer device. We have a three nanometer device, but this just a no name. So what's actually the inside of this technology. For example, like in this period here, we are mainly uh, working on the equilibrium scaling. So we try to make our device as a smaller as a possible. So we try to do the, we, we scale down our, all of the channel length, dimension, and so on and so on. Because once we uh, scale uh, down the device, we can actually reduce the power consumption. And then also we can try to boost the current that we can have for the semiconductor device. And later on, we will explain why we, we, we will have this benefit based on the very fundamental semiconductor physics equation, we can really understand that the, as we scale, we make our devices smaller, then we can already start to see some good benefits here. And at this moment, that the, what the technology we are mainly use will be the, the high-K metal gate. And we also consider to use a strand, silicon. If you are the first time to hear those words about the scaling, about the high can make your gate, about the strength sequence, then that should be fine. That in later on we will mention this again and again. But at least so far you can start to 
have the, a little bit feeling about what the typical uh, device uh, technology we have been used. And then once we move further for beyond like the N16 here, we have something more uh, 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 structure that can be made for our continued uh, scaling. So now we are actually have the different approach. We have the new transistor. And then we have the new structure. And we have a new material. So the typical, previously we, we just make our dimension as small as uh, possible and then we can already enable the high performance. But the problem is that uh, there's still some limitation like beyond like N16 and, and further we found out that the, the equilibrium scaling is not enough. So we need to have the, some more innovation in the, not only for the device structure, but also for the uh, 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 transistor, but also materials. So that's why that the semiconductor technology actually right now is a multi-discipline uh, knowledge domain. So that's why I believe it so far. I have to quickly go through the, the background for everyone here. You have the background come from the electrical engineering. You have background come from the material science. Your background come from nano technology and so on, even for the chemistry. But uh, to be honest, we all need all this uh, fundamental uh, knowledge that can help us to continue to improve our semiconductor device. So here I give some example that uh, what are actually the current, uh, the latest technology we are using. For example, we are right now for all your cell phone, the very high-end cell phone you have is based on the, the FinFET technology. And the, in FinFET technology, we also will use, uh, for example, high mobility channel. And then also we will use, for example, the very advanced lithography. That's what we call the EUV. Uh, in, in, in this class, we will not talk about the, the process. So we have the many different process related class in the, over, over in the NYCU, you can try to follow that one. You can learn more about the technology here. But in here, we mainly focus on device physics and how the device operation, but sometimes we will still have the, a little bit uh, tap about a certain of the very advanced uh, process here. So these are the some innovation that can help us to continue to for the semiconductor scaling. So introduction of the strand silicon and then the high K metal gate. So this is high K metal gate technology. and also the thin fat EUV and the high mobility transistor and also the DTCO actually the push the industry through the next decade and then have to get to the beyond 5 nanometer. So what exactly is the DTCO? So the DTCO is design technology. co-optimization. So, so far, for the, the, the IC designer in the past, they consider this is a very a regular transistor. They don't need to know what exactly the transistor look like. But if we want to continue to improve our device performance, it's necessary for the IC designer, they also need to know about how that the, exactly the transistor look like. Because the transistor can be the thin fat, can be the gate all around, can be made by 2D material, can be made by the ferro electric. And even sometimes for the memory, we have the typical flash memory, we have the, the resistivity memory, we have the ferro electric memory. So this actually, the different type of a device will bring the different actually the, the design, the 
guidance, so the design will be actually completely different if we have a different uh, transistor type here. So therefore, for the next level, not only for this transistor and material innovation, it's also very crucial to have the design technology co-optimization. So therefore, the device itself, including the MOSFET, including the, the, the film fat, or some certain of the current and then voltage equation, is this knowledge not only needed for the uh, people working on the device, but also needed for the people who actually working on IC designer because they need to design the, their circuit based on the different uh, technology uh, itself because the technology has a different uh, uh, pros and cons here. Okay. So here is uh, some detail for the TSMC, the 5 nanometer technology. So you can see that the some keywords, so this is uh, the paper published in the IEDM 2020. And then you can see that uh, some previous work we have mentioned is already written on this title. So the title is 5 nanometer CMOS production technology platform featuring full-fledged EUV. So you can see that there's already the EUV already mentioned, that's how we already mentioned before. And the uh, high mobility channel, and also the fin fat, with uh, density of certain of the s cell for mobile, this is for the mobile SOC, and also for the application for the high performance computing here. So you can see, yes. Yes, the mobile SOC is a uh, silicon on chip used in the mobile, mobile phone here. Okay, so this is uh, the latest result that they share some detail about the 5 nanometer in the TSMC technology here. So I believe everyone here is a graduate uh, uh, student here. You, in the future, in the soon, you will start to read a little bit about the 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 some a uh, paper that request for your research, so here is an example that uh, alongs every paper. The most important part for sure is the uh, abstract. So normally when we read the abstract, we can almost get at least more than fifty percent of the understanding of that paper. And of course, for some detail, you need to look at uh, in the rest of part in the for example the results a uh, discussion here. In here, we can uh, go through this abstract together. So the uh, leading edge of 5 nanometer CMOS platform technology helps define and optimize for the mobile and then high performance computing application. So you can see that uh, for the 5 nanometer or even for 3 nanometer, the target applications will be our cell phone or for our very high performance computing. The high performance computing can be used for the the data analysis for be, can be used for the cloud application or even inside of right now for the autonomous car, for the, for the self-driving car, we also need to have the high performance computing. So this is application used for these two. And the industry leading 5 nanometer technology feature for the first time, so as they say, this is first time we have the EUV and we have the high mobility channel film fat. So that's a key contribution that come from this paper they claim. I'm not sure that this is true or not, but at least at this paper they claim that this is the first time they have the EUV and they have the high mobility channel that to enable the film fat technology here. So here this is a typical characteristic that for the device, people like us, we are care the most, which is usually is considered the drain current versus the gate voltage. So this is the drain current. And this is our gate bias, gate voltage. 
So the reason that we need to uh, look at for the IDVG characteristic, we will uh, talk about later for the every different technology, not only for the FinFET, for very old fashioned MOSFET or for, for the very old uh, CMOS or whatever, even for the some wide band gate device or 2D device, we all look at for the IDVG characteristic. So this is very important. This is a very important characteristic that we need to evaluate for the semiconductor device here. And you can see inside of this IDVG curve, they show that there's a four curve. For example, in the right hand side, you can see this is a, the IDVG at the VD 0.75 volt. And this is a drain current at the 0.05 volt. And this is how we usually call the NFAT. And on the other hand, you have the completely opposite uh, characteristic for the PFAT. Whether you will have the, you need to apply the negative gate bias, and then you can see your current will start to increase here. So this is negative gate bias, and this is a positive gate bias here. So that's a major difference between the NFAT of PFAT. And for sure that uh, if we can make the N fat and P fat together. That's generally we call this as a CMOS technology. And for sure, we will later on to explain what does mean the N fat or P fat, and also what is the full name for the CMOS technology. But uh, at least if you don't know, then this just uh, you can start to have the feeling that this actually is uh, some terms we will uh, say again and again in the future. And of course, for the transistor characteristic, we will have a certain characteristic we are very interested in. For example, we are interested in the D-ball. We were interested in, in the swim. And those items we will explain later. For this class, we will teach everyone what it is, this unfair. What it is a PFAT and what actually the CMOS technology and why we are so care about the D-ball and why we so care about the SWIFT. So we all will lecture in this class. Okay, so recently the demanding of a new application, as you may know, such as a 5G or AI or cloud computing or even for the electric vehicle, EV, that's actually trigger the innovation of the semiconductor technologies here. So this is uh, also the slide that come from the TSMC. So they can see that from the early time, from 1987 until right now, we are in the time of a five nanometer or three nanometer and this technology is mainly used, for example, for the AI or 5G application here. So this is advanced CMO technology have been the key enabler for the innovation of the 28 or 16 nanometer. So if you are using the smartphone, that's many based on can be used for the 4G, and that's actually which is based on the 28 and 16 nanometer technology. But if you have a cell phone, that's actually already have the function, for example, like the AI, for example, like the 5G. Actually, this already the based on the 7 nanometer and even 5 nanometer uh, semiconductor technologies here. On the other hand, this is another one that I want to draw the attention here is uh, electrical vehicle. So the electrical vehicle is also inside, has many, many uh, semiconductor uh, device inside. For example, we will have need to have the onboard charger. That's many to charge our battery. So we have a battery management. We also need to have the high V load. That's actually the AC to DC to drive our wheel. And we need to have the DC, DC and main drive. So these are actually also enabled 
by our technology, by our semiconductor technology, as uh, you can see from here. Okay, so the core knowledge of the state of our semiconductor technology is a uh, semiconductor device and physics. which actually is essential for the every researcher engineer. So if you are interested in the future in this uh, industry, then for sure that you need to understand what's actually the semiconductor device and physics here. So in this class, the property of semiconductor material, so we will explain that what's the typical material we use, and then the physics of the carrier. The carrier here, it means about the electron and hole. So we will talk about that how the electron and hole will be transported in our semiconductor material. And the operation principle, so how the device can function, how the device can work for the some most important device architecture. For example, we will cover the first one, which is the diodes. The second one will be the MOSFET. And then the third one will be the BJT, and the last one will be the JFET. Will be introduced and then discussed in detail. And then among these four different uh, devices, the most important one will be the dial. So the dial and the MOSFET which will put uh, many, many attention on this because this is actually the fundamental block for the every device. So even you are working in the film fair or 2D or whatever, or power device, actually the basic fundamental part is still related to the dial and the MOSFET here. So here I give some typical idea that how that the dial look like. So dial, it's a device that have the P and N junction together. So the P, which means that this is a material that's full of the hole. And then N is a material that full of the electrons here. And then inside, so the basic structure for dial is very simple, just a combination mm -hmm. of the P-type and N-type semiconductor material. And once we put together, that's already the one device we are used very often. And inside of this dial, the most important uh, physics will be happen between this interface. And that's we usually call this as a P N junction. So therefore we will spend a little bit time explaining that how that the P N junction will look like and then the why that the, the how the electron and hole will be able to transport inside of this P N junction. Yeah. Okay, so that's the first most important one. And then the second one, which is the MOSFET. So the MOSFET is a structure that looks like in this way. We have the first one, that's what we call the substrate. And most of the time, the substrate will be the P-type. And then we make on our silicon material. So we have a P-type silicon substrate. Okay, and then we will try to do some tricky things, try to do the certain of the doping, try to make the, the certain part of our P-type become N-type region. So we will make this place, that's what we call the N plus, N plus. 
So usually this is made by the doping, which is can be made due to by the, for example, the implantation or the uh, diffusion here. So we will not uh, discuss uh, how that can be happen, but later we will uh, shortly talk about this. And then we will start to make a certain of the insulator. So we make this as an insulator here. So and usually we use a silicon dioxide as an insulator. And then we will make the gate region. We will make the gate metal on top of our insulator. And we have the name for the different region. For example, in the left hand side, we call this as a source. In the right hand side, we call this as a drain here. And then the full name for the MOSFET is actually called this as a metal and oxide and semiconductor. And feel effective. Transistor. Okay, so that's a full name. That's why in the short we call the MOSFET. So we have a metal. This is the metal. We have the oxide. This is our oxide. And we have the semiconductor. So this is a semiconductor. So that's why we call this is MOS. So we have a metal, we have oxide, we have a semiconductor. And this transistor is driven by applying the electrical field. So that's why we call this of the field, effective transistor here. So this is a full name of the MOSFET. And there's a certain name that we don't explain now, but you can start to uh, look at this, is how we call this as a source and this is a dream. Uh, for the student who is the first time to learn this, actually it's quite often that you will try to uh, Google that one in, and try to find the, the, like the Mandarin translation, Chinese translation. That's the same thing that I have done before when I was first time to look at this. So the Chinese name for this is called the Yuan Ji. The Chinese name called this dream is called the Ji Ji. But to, to be honest, I don't think the Chinese translation uh, does any help because the Renji and Jiji is still very confused. So please try yourself to just in the first time try to memorize this name. In the future, actually the name, it doesn't really that important. It's more important to understand the physics later here. So this is the MOSFET. And the third one, which is very important, in the past, also for the specific application. But uh, of course, for the advanced logic, we don't use that uh, very often any, anymore, but it's still quite important, which is uh, the BJT. The full name for the BJT is a bipolar junction transistor. And the BJT structure actually is very similar to our dial. We just have the two back-to-back -back dial here. So we have the PNP here. So you can see the dial here is only one PN junction. But for the BJT, we have the two PN junction here. And therefore, the fundamental of the BJT still will rely on the typical dial. Okay, so this is something that we will uh, cover in this class and we will also explain. All of the, the electronic nodes will be uploaded in the E3 again. So you, if, you, if you miss it, yes. Sorry? 
Oh, you mean the the recorded video? Uh, I try. I try. It. This will be my first time to record it using the iPad. So previous in the last semester, if some of you already follow my uh, reliability class, I actually do my best to upload the video. And um, but that one because I'm using the Google Meet for the recording. So today I'm trying to use the iPad to record it. If successfully, for sure, that I will upload. With so no doubt. But for the electronic notes that uh, I will also upload here, so you can. If you miss something, you can uh, look at the slide later. Okay. So, furthermore, the recent progress and challenge in the developing beyond the what we generally call as a Moore's law. So, if you are interested in the semiconductor news, I think you will be already very familiar with what's the Moore's law. Here will be reviewed here. So in the beginning of the class, I already showed that uh, there's a video. Actually, this is a very recent video interview with uh, Dr. Golden Moore, which is very old, old man. I think he's right now is at least eighty or ninety years old. So he spent a little bit interview to explain that the uh, how that the Moore's law important for him or also for the semiconductor. Industry. So, in here, when we talk about Moore's law, is mainly related to the semiconductor technology, relating to the scaling. So that means that this is certainly that you already see the news that uh, we are trying to develop the beyond the twenty-two nanometer, and so far, we are in the age of 5 nanometer and next phase will be 3 nanometer and so on and so on. So this is a technology that actually follow the Moore's law, which is typically we call this as a more more. So the purpose for the more more technology is trying to make our device as small as possible. And this is something that you will here from the news that uh, every day has a news about uh, whether the Moore's law will be dead or not. But uh, however, actually there's a certain part of the technology didn't care about the Moore's law. That's generally we call this uh, more than more. So in this technology as shown here, Actually, we don't really have to scale down our device, and we really don't care about the Moore's law here. For example, we have an analog RF, we have the high voltage power, and this we have the sensor, we have the biochip. These are the technologies that uh, we call this as the more than more. And then the major uh, purpose for this technology is to interacting with the people environment. As shown here. So therefore, when we consider, for example, the sensor, when you consider like the biochip, when we consider the power device, actually the purpose for this technology is mainly to interact with uh, the people and environment here. So therefore, we don't really need to follow the Moore's law. So as you have already heard the news, that uh, there is always a rumor that uh, if the Moore's law is dead, and then the, all of the semiconductor technology or industry will start to be uh, uh, go down. But however, this is not true because we still have the technology that calls the more than more, which we don't actually really follow the Moore's law. Okay, so here is a certain of the the some uh, teaching philosophy for this uh, class here. So I will try to review uh, what we call the Bloom's taxonomy here. So this is come from the educational psychologist, which his name is Dr. Benjamin Bloom, which is very famous in the educational psychology here. So he proposed that uh, if we try to learn something new stuff, there's a six level of the different that about the learning here. That's how they call this six level of the learning. So 
for sure, the first label is remember. So when you try to learn the new things, the, the lowest level is just remember, but uh, you don't understand. And second level is understand. So you start to catch up some key point here. And then the third level is you start able to use this knowledge to apply in the sum of the situation. And then you even have the chance to analyze and then also for the evaluate here. And also the last one is create here. For most of you, you are the graduate student here. So actually for the thesis requirement, most of uh, your thesis requirement is for sure not only the remember, but also you start to involve for the analyze. So you will analyze certain of your research. You will evaluate and even in the end, you will create something new that are based on the thesis. Yes. Yes, you can. You can need to discuss with your thesis advisor. So that's actually the, I think most advisor will be very happy that if your thesis creates something new. And that's also, it's uh, uh, the new, it, it, it doesn't mean that completely new. The new can be also just solve a question. So the innovation is not the only consider like you create a very, very new stuff the innovation can be also considered that you try to solve the problem that never had any solution before. So that also can be considered as a create here. And of course, in this class, we are not able to cover everything. But I at least hope in the end, we can still cover up to the evaluate here. So we, are, we don't have the chance that uh, allow you to create something in this class. But at least in the end of this class, you were able to evaluate the different semiconductor technology. You are able to analyze uh, what's the difference between the MOSFET, why we need to consider the like substitution swing, and how we can apply this knowledge. So this is my expectation for everyone who actually uh, follow this class. Also, this class is designed based on the, what we call the constructive alignment. So the constructive alignment, you will have the three uh, circles that in the end will build up this class. The first one is uh, what we call the intending learning outcome. That's what we call the IEO. So intending learning outcome in the Mandarin, we call the Yu Qi Xue Xi Cheng Guo. So therefore, I already think about that uh, by the end of this class, what you actually should know for this class. So this is a uh, intending learning outcome is something that by the end of this class, what you should know. Okay, so that's uh, the first pillar that they're trying to build up for this class. And second one, for sure, we still have a certain of the assessment and task. So you will have the certain of the homework and even we will try to arrange, arrange some activities that help you to be familiar with the, the knowledge that you learn from this class. And also we will have the teaching activities. So in this class will be mainly designed by consider these three pillars here and then we will expand that the what exactly of these uh, three pillars inside of this class. So first one, the intending learning outcomes, which means this is uh, So by the end of this class, 
you should be able first one explain the basic material properties and device physics and second one apply the device physics to evaluate the operation operation principle of the PN dial MOSFET BJT and JFET here and third one Evaluate the current issue in the scaling technology. So once you are finishing this card, you should be able to have the certain knowledge that uh, once you see the the very advanced uh, scaling technology, then you should know that what's the typical uh, goal for this technology. For example, short channel effect. We have the ultra thin dielectric and substitute swim. And these are the, all the critical issues for the advanced technology. And then we are actually, you will be able to identify the problem for this device here. And also, in the end, you are also able to propose a design to overcome the challenges in the scaling semiconductor technology here. So I hope that by the end, that once you see the certain issues, you will still come out a certain idea that uh, what the possible solution to address these issues. Although the solution sometimes might not be realistic, but at least it's a good way to think about this. And also, as I say, the innovation is not purely like you created something new. The innovation is also about the problem solving. So once you solve the problem, it's already the, it's a huge innovation. So I believe everyone sees this is also trying to solve the certain issues here. So you should be uh, feel honored that once you finish your thesis, once you finish your degree, you are already in the way of the innovation. Okay. Second, this is a teaching and learning uh, activity here. So we will have the textbook which is based on Neiman for semiconductor physics and device. This is the fourth edition. It's not required to have the hard copy, but uh, at least you can find out from the electronic book, I believe from the NYCU library, you already can have the, the semiconductor physics and device, uh, this ebook here. But it's highly recommended to have at least this book. For myself, that. Uh, I also have the hard copy. Even right now, uh, I have been working in the, this field maybe for the 10 years. Even right now, sometimes, time to time, I still will go back to check this uh, book because I found out it's a very useful textbook. You can consider that one is like the dictionary. So whenever you need it, just look up to see that uh, what you actually can find it. Because usually the textbook is contains too many information is difficult to digest in the one semester or even in the several years. But the once you are more experienced in this field, you will still discover more unknown. Then you need to go back to look at this kind of like the tool books here. Um, we will have the course slide with the lecture note. We have the video. We have the in the one of the uh. Homework is about the band diagram so well, so we, we will request everyone to write, use of the software to do some band diagram analysis. And if you have any question, you can email me. And we have the TA here, so uh, she will help us for the mainly for the homework grading. And also, I request everyone that uh, for the very instantaneous communication and more efficient uh, corresponding. I request everyone to join this uh, uh, Facebook. This Facebook is many uh, create for this class. It's called the uh, SPD uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2022. So for this class here, because you know for the E3 actually it's not very convenient if we have a certain urgent things we want to uh, inform. Yes? I saw that in the syllabus, we have a calendar for visiting TSMC museum. What will that 
Uh, this will depend on the, the COVID-19 situation. So that's uh, because uh, due to the, the COVID-19 right now, everything is not, uh, uh, cannot be fixed yet. Even I'm not sure that uh, how long we can have this physical class. So in the last semester, some of you already have the class in my last semester. We run a while, a quite a long time for the online class. But the online class is sometimes a little bit boring because for the online class, of course, it's very convenient. Everyone can stay at home. But the problem will be that uh, after the whole online class for the whole semester, I cannot recognize everyone. You cannot recognize me because I'm looking might not be the same as the picture I put. So therefore, so the physical class is still more have the interaction here. I hope, and then also there's a one uh, problem is that for this semester, we have a quite a uh, student in this class. So right now we have more than 60. So after these two weeks, we may even have the more than 70 students here. So the TSMC Museum can be only allowed the 15 students at the one time. So we will think about this. So it's not a, uh, uh, it's not well, uh, not decided yet so far. Okay. So we will announce later. Okay. Yes. Is the trip mandatory or optional? It's optional. It's not required. It's uh, just uh, but actually that uh, if you are interested, you can also visit there by yourself because they say all welcome for the the student who will be there. We run up this uh, visiting, uh, not last year. Last year is also suffering from the COVID nineteen, so we cannot visit there. We run up this visiting from the two years ago. It was very nice. You can see some amazing stuff there. Uh, amazing stuff there. Okay. And one more thing, I want to uh, uh, adjust the the time that. Uh, it's difficult, I believe, difficult for everyone. That the original, this class is scheduled begin from the 9 to the 12 on every Monday here. So the class on the Monday morning is tough, not only for you, but also for me as well. And also, but I still, each semester, I still would like to put my class on the Monday morning because I hope that everyone can have very refreshed on the Monday blue, okay? And, but uh, I still want to change a little bit because the nine is difficult for you. And therefore I suggest we can change from the 9.30 from now on. And we just short for the break time. Usually in the nine to 12, we have the two break. And one break is 20 minutes. And one break is a 10 minutes here. So my class is pretty free, you can, Leave and come anytime you can have breakfast, but I don't, I don't know that we can have breakfast in, maybe we can. So, uh, because I'm not sure that for the COVID-19 regulation, but I think maybe everyone can have breakfast here. So for me, it's fine that you can do whatever here you can, if you are want to go to a toilet, you want to have a break, you can just leave the classroom. So I propose that we start the class at 9.30, just like the today. And we only have the break one time, uh, around like 11. And then we will run out the class at the 12 time here. And then the after 12 time, that will be the uh, Q and A time. So, yes. Do you prefer students to ask questions in class after class or time for class? Well, you can ask the question anytime. You can stop me anytime. You can in the class or after class. But I'm welcome everyone who can be very actively to ask the question in here because that's uh, more interaction. Your question will be actually the question that come from other students, but uh, some students might feel shy, so they don't, uh, they, are, they are afraid to ask. So it's always welcome to ask a question. Yes, go ahead. Do you have all this hour? Yes, I think I announced, but you are, it's more convenient that you send me the email if you are, uh, you will willing to ask me a question because the office hours sometimes can be a little bit dynamic because of the, the some certain urgent uh, tasks that therefore it's better you put a, uh, make appointment with myself. And also 
just a one experience that uh, when I was a master student like here, I finished my master degree in the Qingda. I also feel very shy to ask a question like the like all of you. I think this is a typical Asian student style. It's not your fault. I think it's a generally typical Asian student style. But when I was a peer student in the Europe, I found out that the the all of my classmates they are very active to ask a question. Even the question is looks sounds very stupid. But they just if they feel they don't like the clearly understand, they just have a question, they just immediately raise their hand and they don't care about the, how other people feel about their question. So actually, after a certain time, I start to feel like a, uh, in the past, I'm not sure for the everyone is why that uh, you will be afraid to ask a question. But at least for myself, is that uh, when I was a math student, I try to ask a question, I always think about that uh, this student might be too stupid. The, the professor will feel like uh, oh, you, are, you don't do your homework enough, you don't study enough, or your classmate will feel like, uh, okay, this is very easy question, stupid question, why do you act? But uh, when I was in Europe, I found that all of my classmates also act very stupid questions. So therefore, I start to be more courage to ask a trick, uh, questions here. And even right now that uh, I can uh, feel like the you don't have to feel very shame about your question because your question is definitely also the question from the other students. So we welcome that everyone here to ask the question. Then we can have the uh, more interaction and you can stop and stop it anytime. You don't have to ask a question during the break or after class. You can stop anytime as you want. Okay. So in here, we have the homework, we have the in-class assignment. So homework, ideally, we will have the eight or nine homework. I, I forget, I need to check it out. But uh, and usually in the last uh, semester, each homework will be graded. But actually, in this time, we have uh, quite a amount of students here. And I decided that, uh, to reduce the loading for my teaching assistant and also therefore only the half of the homework will be grading so and then the half of the homework is for yourself for the self review so this is a graduate graduate class so therefore I expect everyone who joined this class they have much more higher motivation in learning it's not like the underclass or high school class you need a teacher to push you so i hope that everyone can even have the self-review just you just review the homework because the homework is important the most uh at least 60 percent of the exam the question in the exam will come from the homework okay so this is a uh, evaluation and grading policy here so sorry this is a uh, this is a slide that uh, I forgot to modify. So there's a NYCU only because in the last semester, this course will be also put online for the other university. But in this semester, we only have the NYCU student here. Okay, so we have the two exams here. And then each exam, two exams will be total consider 75 percentage here. So the two exams, including the midterm exam and the final exam. And the midterm exam is closed book. And the final exam is open book. And the final exam will be covered for the material from the beginning to the end. So that's why I set up for the open book because it's a huge amount of content is from the first class to the last class but the open book sometimes good that you can bring forever for my class for the open book there's some student in in this classroom who have joined my class before my open book is pretty open you can bring anything you want you can bring the laptop you can bring the the, the ipad you can use the internet you can do whatever you want but my suggestion is that uh, uh, you still need to be very familiar with the content because otherwise you will spend too much time in searching the material and that will waste your time. So 
the previous experience in the open book is always that the student doesn't have enough time to finish because they expect that they don't have to prepare. They just come to this class and try to Google it, but they found out that it just completely wastes their time. Okay, yes? Uh, it's half, half. Oh, so it's 100, 100. Yes, it's half. So we have a seventy-five percent. So each one is thirty-seven point five percentage. Will that be held online or by paper? Uh, ideally, it will be held in the classroom. Yes, if there is a the emergent, there's a certain urgent situation, we are not able to run. And physically, we can still run online. No, we don't have it. We only have the one the practice for the band diagram software. Okay. Does the attendance uh, consist of local and class participation or You mean the attendance will come for the score? Yes, attendance will come for the score, so it's here. So it's a fifty percent. Yes, we will check your name list. Yes. So the homework is 50%. I don't do the attendance very often. For the attendance check, but I don't do that very often. So uh, last semester, uh, for my another course in reliability, I think I only checked the name list twice. Only twice. So, so therefore, I believe the attendance is something that a free score for everyone. So as I say, this is a graduate class. It's fine that you don't show up as long as you, but it's important to show up in the midterm final. So last semester, there's a one student who didn't show up to final, and then in the end he, he, he failed. And this is only the one student failed in my class because he didn't show up in the final exam. So therefore, however, I know that uh, this is just the first week of the class. I think everyone is still very relaxing. But uh, with time moving on, you will become very busy because you will have the multiple classes. You are not only have one class, you have the three to four. You also have the pressure come from your professor. And therefore, those things will mix in. You will be, become very busy. You will not fully pay attention to this class. But I still suggest that at least you try your best to like the, deliver the homework and try to your best to join the exam. And, if you meet all these requirements, normally you won't get failed. Okay? Yes? Yes, so every exam we will have the sum, what we call the curvy, we will have curvy in the score. No, I will have my own equation. It's not only the linear equation. I will see the situation. Oh, okay. yeah. uh, it's important, but I believe that uh, in the end, the score will, uh, quite huge of the score will be adjusted for sure. Yeah. Uh, will the uh, from the TSMC or something else be... No, we won't have because of the... Uh, this call is much more like the fundamental and also essential for the device. So for a speaker who come from the industry, usually they talk about a very advanced part. Therefore, we, we will not do this in this class. Yes? Why does ICSP not have semiconductor physics and device too? Oh, because the semiconductor physics and device one is already cover everything. Oh, nice. Okay, okay. So uh, this is also the one, uh, some, some problem that I see in the typical the Taiwanese university. So in the past, actually, I'm not sure for everyone, but uh, you can see that uh, at least uh, the, for some of the, the college, they have a semiconductor device, physics one, semiconductor device, physics two, and even have the solid state physics, solid state one and solid state two. And my policy is actually what we call the less is more. Actually, when we talk about the semiconductor physics and device too, it's already too deep for everyone. 
we will spend too much time in discussing the very advanced, like film fair, and those things should be that you should have the capability to learn that before. So let me tell you my experience before. When I was in Qingda, I also joined the semiconductor physics device one and two. I joined the solid state phys solid state physics one and two. You, I think you might heard about what the solid state physics, which is very very difficult. The Gu Tai Wu Li. And when I moved to the Europe, the Europe has a shorter semester. You know that in in the past Taiwan has an eighteen semester. And then the eighteen semester create the problem is that every professor want to put. So many stuff in the course. In the end, after like the uh fifteen weeks, after sixteen weeks, I think there's no student can follow up because the rest of part is too complicated. It's only related to the specific area or to for the specific uh, student who might be interesting because this is too deep. But right now it's good. We only have a sixteen. But my experience in Europe, we only have around ten weeks. So. Our semester is start around like October, and we will finish before the Christmas. So Christmas is around like the by the end of the December. So you only have the two months class, and then two months class we finish the semiconductor physics and device. And there's no one and two. There's only one class called semiconductor physics and device, and there's only one class called solid state physics. So we use only the two months to finish all of them. The idea is that、uh, we quickly scratch the surface. If you feel interested in it, you should have yourself to digging out by yourself. You should pay more attention. If you are really interested in this class, you can spend more time in yourself. You can learn, uh, learn the stuff. And rather than that, we teach the each chapter very detail, chapter to chapter. And then most of the time, that the, not every student will able to follow. And therefore, that's why in here we only have a semiconductor physics and device one. And to be honest, uh, if you are but not not everyone is my student. Some of you are my student. If you are my student, usually I will not suggest you to follow the semiconductor physics and device two, because I believe you are the graduate student. You should have the capability to learn the new stuff by themselves, rather than. Expanding that your all knowledge all come from the class, all the knowledge we lecture here is already the thirty years old knowledge. These are the 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 knowledge that have been discovered for thirty years now. It's pretty fundamental. But、uh, if you want to learn something new, you should start to learn by yourself. Okay. No, to be honest, for my class, there's no any requirement for your previous background. We will also cover for the quantum mechanics here. We will only cover the one I feel most important, and the one I feel most relevant to the rest of the discussion. If you look at for the quantum mechanics books, for my experience, I never really read the book for the called quantum mechanics. So I never follow that class. I only、uh, use the knowledge I feel useful, and which I will be lecture in this class. So there's actually there's no requirement that、uh, we really need everything. No, that's、uh, many related to circuit, so we will not cover for the circuit. Yes, we will only cover for physics and device. As I say, less is more. So we, I don't want to expand the topic too wide, and in there become the everyone's burden. And I'm curious about how do you determine if you are you have passion about semiconductor physics? Because you, as I mentioned, it's a little bit students interested passion for this course. How do you determine if you have passion or not? No, that's a good question. I think everyone here. I'm not sure that the I I think everyone here, sitting here doesn't mean that the, they have the passion, because of a, this is a required course, yes. 
For some required calls, it's a relative hard call because it's really fundamental. But the only passion comes from that if you are really interested in this industry. If you are not interested in the semiconductor industry, then that actually proves that you're probably not passionate about this class. Well, we don't cover about the memory circuit here. So therefore, uh, maybe I'm not sure that, yes, but in the memory circuit, you still need to have the MOSFET. You still need to have the device. The memory circuit itself is not only to talk about circuit. You still need to understand the device. No, that's not true. Yeah, that's not completely true. That depends on the application. Okay. Okay, let's move on. Uh, how about let's just take a break. So we have a 10.40, so let's take back in the 10 minutes. Okay, so we will move. So today, ideally, we'll finish the class. We will not run completely till 12. So ideally, we'll be finished around like 11.30 or 11.40. Okay. Okay. If you have any question, you are welcome to ask me now. I know, I know. I was to teach the teacher. Yes. Okay. 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 Okay.
，对对对。但是呃，我觉得呃，如果音乐院主管的话，他应该还是会觉得只修过两堂课，这个品质是不够的。而且他们要讲经验的话，通常会，比如说你现在讲的两个八档经验，对，他会问你那个八档。或者过去你们对你们，或者哪一种原件，有些人对，但是也是我觉得现在对我们还是比较辛苦一点，对，对对对。我可以开放房间啊，但是我建议如果要修的话，还是修开放房，因为房间的话，呃，通常房间的通常过一阵子之后就会消失，对，就会没有人学到，对，然后呃，某种程度上。会比较少一点 pressure， 少一点 pressure 的话，其实是会比较少。旁听是没问题啊，但是过去的经验是，那旁听大概四五周之后，大概其实就消失了。对，那其实我前四五周的的时间其实就浪费。对。呃，你你过去你你之前是呃大学准备，也是气管吗？不是，我是文组。哦，文组的哦。哎，好吧，那那那那确实。如果说他，所以你对物理化学这些呃没有太多的经验吗？嗯，没有。呃，对啊，对啊，对啊，就就是会会比较 care， 就是说像是电流、电压、啊，然后可能会人家讲一些专有的术语，对，你可以知道说哦，就是会对那种物理的参数稍微比较有点 sense， 因为说我们会有一些 gay bias 啊。会比较一些，会有一些 sense， 就是不会人家讲就完全知道，然后就很耳熟。对对对。这个刚刚有讲说，确定会改时间。啊，确定会会改时间，对对对。那前两周都在这。前两周在这边，对。之后就是在。之后还不确定，对，之后还不确定，会希望在这边，但是这间教室现在还在敲。这堂课教的是介绍一些比较重要、稍微重要的元件，对，是会需要去什么看它的什么什么物理特性的啊？对对对对，会对会对会。你是哪个所的学生？我是，算职工，是大学是职工，那现在是那个新的系生。哦，你是那个什么 AI 那边的，是不是？哦，这份。就是你能智能说的哦 ，OK OK OK。然后，那你是研究所，你是要做什么题目？硕士班题目。你的老师是谁？知道教授？呃，应该是林一平老师。哦，可是林一平老师做的真的蛮职工的、欸。对啊，那，那那你会需要上这门课吗？呃，我问过学长，他说老师。觉得学生想学什么就学什么。对对对对，那是 OK 啊。但是我是说，林一平老师做的东西可能跟我们这门课，如果你现在做一些，就是我知道像那个 AI 那边的有些老师做一些电路的，对，那电路的话我觉得就 OK， 或是用 AI 用在半导体上面，这我觉得 OK。但是林一平老师做的东西，我觉得据我了解，应该跟这门课上的东西没有没有什么关系。但是你当然要学，我当然也是觉得没问题啊。对。之后我要做的应该是。偏这个语音相关的，对对对啊，对啊，所以开始，对对对啊，想说，对，就是看到开的课程，对，然后想说看看修不修得了。OK OK。那之前有大概修过有点类似的课程，就是大学的时候，对，但是因为就是别的科系，对，然后就是那老师也是说开放外系，对，所以他有些东西他没有特别去讲，对。像是什么有一些图表，然后那个曲线，对对对对对对对，对那个他就说这个是本科系才教过，啊，像我就看不懂，啊，他说没关系，我们这堂课不着重在这里 ，OK， 所以这堂课我们都会教，因为这个是对。这堂课上课很多东西都是对我们这边的学生，大部分都还是跟偏半导体的啦。对，不管是国办院或者前瞻半导体，或者他们以后都是想跟国办，所以基本上这些东西对他们来说都是未来会要分析的工具。对。呃，所以会，如果我现在这样都都对对那种不算是了解，那之后会就是。之后会一下就要分析，哎、欸，应该这样讲啦。我觉得我们这边会偏会有一些物理，就只要就确认说你对物理会不会排斥
，因为后面会引爆很多都是物理的公式，就是我们物理方法去分析。对，因为资工的，我觉得资工比较偏数学，对对对吧？对，资工的感觉物理的 equation 比较大，部分都是数学就 equation 算出来。对，那我们这边会比较多是要去了解背后的物理意义，我觉得这这比较重要。对，就是会稍微有一种从从头教的感觉，还是直接就是我们从头教，哦、我们从头教，对对，嗯对，好，好，好，那个下午一点那个厂商来，对，他是我们要帮忙量测嘛，对对对，然后他们就他们给我两颗软件，你就把它先架好，所以他们他们会自己量，对对,對，哎、欸、我们。可能要先帮他量一下，先帮架架好，然后、嗯、架好对对对对，然后参数他们对对对对对，这样。我是这样，可是给那个加钱的。可以啊，可以。你是哪边？我清大，然后校级选修。可以啊，你是未来要来交大念书吗？對對對是那个哪一个所未来的？交大念书。啊，交大可以啊，可以啊，可以欢迎欢迎。清大是清大电机还是什么？呃，清大光光。OK， 没问题啊，之前我的课都会有清大学生。OK， 好，欢迎欢迎。你现在是大学还是研究生？硕二。硕二。哦、呃，刚刚也是有一位气管学生来问啊。对，基本上呃，我先了解一下为什么你想来硕二。因为我们来想要办早期应该这样讲了，我觉得这门课基本上就是你过去没有，你看你大学什么背景？会计。会计。哦，那你至少对数学还行。对对对，就是说我这门课是欢迎各个。不同领域的选择来学，对，所以我是觉得，如果你确定有兴趣的话，我是鼓励的。现在就是比如说上课会用到的那个计算，因为我看到的那些计算的话，对，呃，那个些倒还好，那个那个那些计算倒还好。我们这边其实比较强调是物理的 understanding， 就是物理的 understanding， 那个计算其实对来说那都不是一个最重要的 factor。这是只是透过上课就可以理解，我觉得透过上课可以理解啊。要有背景。我觉得，如果你有兴趣，我是欢迎。对对对对对，但是我当然不确定说这个这门课的难易程度对你怎么样。但是我相信这门课是对所有要懂半导体的人来说都是很重要的，因为你要知道到底有哪些元件，那些元件的话，这样子呃，在这 i n d u s t r y 工作的时候，至少才知道哪些是重要的。例如说，我们在看这些。这个电子产品的时候，我们要看哪些重要的电信？对对，所以基本上这些都会讲到，都会在这边讲到。那可能只是这边课文课会有一个比较 tough 一点，就是我们会要求，就是我们不是要求啦，就是说我们会用比较多物理的东西去解释，解释一些现象。这 equation 我觉得都不是什么问题，对，因为对我来说，甚至到最后 final 已经是 open book 嘛， open book 就是说 equation 任何东西你都可以带进去嘛。那重点是你要对那个东西有理解。那我是觉得。如果要修过这门课，其实正常来说，你只要把 homework 好好搞懂的话，我觉得要修课就不太太困难了。对对对对对，因为 homework 可能会，我们也会给解答啊，然后什么之类的。所以如果说你真的真的没有办法 follow 到全部，但至少你把 homework 都搞懂的话，对我觉得基本上要过都不是问题。对对对。对
Okay. So we will continue for this class. So there's uh, several questions that uh, I have been asked during the break. So the general question is that uh, if I don't have the background, can I follow this class? So my suggestion is that if you feel like you're really inter interested in the semiconductor industry, that for sure that it's necessary that everyone should have the knowledge about the semiconductor device. And there's no specific requirement for this class. So whatever the background you have before, it's all welcome. But in the, when the class move a little bit further, we will start to spend more time using the physics to understand the device operation. So equation for me is not that important, as you may know. In the midterm exam, although it's closed book, but we will provide the necessary uh, equation. In the final exam, it's open book, so for sure that every equation you don't have to memorize, you can just use, that you can look up for the textbook, find out the exact equation that you want. So the mathematics is not will be the problem. And then as long as you are still feel interesting that you would like to learn something about the physics and try to use the physics to understand the, the device behavior, and then I don't think that's a problem for this class. And also, if you don't have the previous background, uh, my suggestion is that at least you need to really familiar with the homework because the homework, we will have the many, many similar questions come from homework. So if you are familiar with homework, then that should be no problem that uh, you will uh, pass this class. Okay, this is my uh, device. Okay, so here we will start to talk about the semiconductor, the past and then the future. The first one is we need to understand what is actually the semiconductor is. So the semiconductor is a material that's between conductor and insulator. So uh, the conductor and insulator is a very well-known well material that we already have every day. For example, the insulator is include the glass, the plastic, the body and su jia, which is the typical the insulator we have uh, in the, our daily life. And the typical feature for the insulator is a very low conductivity. Conductivity is a uh, which is uh, a kind of the, the, the characteristic to evaluate that the, how actually the material can transport for the current or not. So therefore, that's uh, what we call the conductivity. So in insulator is generally we consider as a low conductivity material. And on the other hand, we have a something which is a conductor, dowty. And for example, the metal is a conductor. So the typical uh, characteristic for the conductor is a high <coughs> conductivity. High conductivity. And in this class, we are, I assume everyone who is interested for the engineering and therefore for the engineering part, we are in actually care about the current and the voltage characteristic. So therefore, if you look at the typical ideal characteristic for the insulator, which is the Y axis is a current and then the x axis is a voltage. And then the insulator, it means that the, when we apply the voltage, there should be no current. So that's a typical characteristic for the insulator, right? So that's because we expect there's no current flow. On the other hand, if you look at for the conductor, whether we have still have the I current in the Y axis and then the voltage in the X axis here. And the conductor means that there's a very high conductivity. That means 
we apply very small voltage, already there's a high current goes through. So the curve here should be very, very steep, like here, because we apply the small voltage already gives us a very high current here. And then usually the slope of this curve is uh, our resistance. So resistance is a uh, one over of our, uh, our conductivity. So this is another term called the resistivity, which is one over our conductivity. Okay, so in general, the semiconductor is a material that can behave the characteristic between the insulator and conductor. That's why we call this as a semiconductor. That's why we call this as a Bandauti, semiconductor. So therefore, the ideal current versus the voltage characteristic should be also in between the insulator and also the conductor. Okay, so this is a current versus a voltage here. So we have the between the current versus voltage. So that's why that the, the semiconductor behaving the characteristic can have the certainly uh, insulating property, but also has a certainly conduction property here. So a semiconductor material has an has an electrical conducting. Has a conducting values between conductor, such as a metal, copper, or insulator, such as a glass. So that's a very fundamental, yes. Yes, and this can be modulated by different voltage. And I remember that when the glass and the plastic are uh, uh, different voltage, they can be touched together and they will have some static electronics. So that's because of the discharging. Oh. That's because of you have the electric charge in the one material and then electric charge in another material and then put it together, that's how we call the triple electricity, and therefore you will start to fill in the discharge. So when the charge is on the surface of This is because of the lowest material insulator, so the charge inside the material cannot be flow away. If this is conductor, so you will never have the electrical discharge in the conductor material. It's only happened in the insulating material. Because of the once you touch your IC, your finger is insulating material. And usually the IC package is also insulating material. So once you touch on that one, you will have the ESD discharge. And ESD discharge will be happen like a thousand volt. So it will immediately damage all your device. And that's not related to discharge, it's related to radiation effect. Oh, so that's different. Yes, radiation effect will continue to bombard or semiconductor IC will cause the same or degradation as well. And they will uh, all cause the purpose of the cost of the defect and decrease the yield of the water. Yes, yes. Okay, so this is some of the semiconductor adaption trends here. So you can see in the early time, that's a mainframe computing. That's a something that probably you haven't been born. That also I haven't been born yet. And then 
the first boonim for the semiconductor is because of due to the demanding of the personal computing. So the personal computing is actually the one person to the one machine. So we have the one person actually trying to use the one machine. That's a personal computing. And later on, as you may know, we start to have a one person to the multiple machine. And that's actually the mobile computing. And right now, we have the multiple machine to the multiple machine here. So all of the machines, that's actually in the area of the, the IoT. So we have the Internet of Things that are trying to connect every device together. And therefore, that's one of the, 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 the reasons that we need to very high performance semiconductor device because the, the machine itself can start to connect it with another machine. That's a, one of the major trends for semiconductor adoption. And also, there's a problem that in the past 10 years is about the data traffic explosion. So, as we start to get in use more and more of this internet service, for the early time with the Google, right now it's for Facebook, for the Netflix, for the Instagram, and so on and so on, and even for the Spotify. Actually, all this software and all this data are plugged, are put in the cloud. And we just download from cloud it, and then we listen in, for example, the Spotify. The, I use the Spotify every day, so then I just download the music. Actually, not download, I just access the music. Spotify can, uh, uh, can be offline, listen, but uh, probably cannot immediately download. So actually, we just put all the data in the, in the cloud. And then, so every day, we actually have many, many data traffic, so on. And then, the, then therefore, we need to have very high-speed internet and high-performance computing to process this data. And here is uh, some review that uh, what happened in the past uh, 60 years that uh, was the most important innovation in the semiconductor industry. And this slide is uh, uh, provided by the, uh, Dr. Morris Chen that uh, he uh, gave a talk in the early time about what he thinks that uh, the, actually the most important innovation. So it's good to see this history from the, his point of view. So the first most important innovation is for sure that the 1948, which is a transistor. So the, in the 1948, the first transistor will be proposed and made by the Bell Lab from the Shockley, Bardeen, and Barton, these guys here. So finally, we start to come up with a certain idea that uh, we can electrically try to operate this transistor then can provide the switch on and off of this function here. But however, the, another important uh, uh, breakthrough is not the, actually the, only the transistor. It's in the second one, is that a few years later, we start to find that there's a very good material that's called a silicon. And silicon is one of the most uh, abandoned, abundant materials that are around the world. So we can use the silicon to make a silicon-based transistor. And the first transistor uh, developed in the 1948, which is not made by silicon, it's made by the germanium. And germanium is not a very stable material, not like the silicon. So therefore, in the 1954, so finally we start to consider using silicon to make the transistor. And then the first company who actually involved for this development is come from the textures instrument. Yes. General, no, not necessary. We don't talk about too much chemistry, yes. And um, the third one, which is uh, in the 1958, is uh, IC, which is integrated circuit. 
IC technology. That's actually the most important guy who actually makes the IC is uh, Jack Kelby from the PI. And therefore, we start to think about that uh, we make the transistor, we can make many, many more, and then we can try to integrate everything together. So that's why we call this as uh, the IT uh, I integrate circuit. Yes? Yes. 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 And then the fourth one is uh, Moore's law. So as you have heard about from this news, that the Moore's law. So the Gordon Moore, whether when he proposed Moore's law, he was in a company called the Fairchild Semiconductor. And then later on, the several big people from the Fair Tribe, they moved, they left the Fair Tribe, and then they start to co-founding the Intel. So in the end, and they have start to have the Intel later on here. So that's the fourth innovation. And then the fifth one is where we start to have the MOS technology. So the MOS is the one that we already mentioned is about the metal oxide semiconductor, this kind of the technology. So that's including the for example the MOSFET. The second one is a silicon gate. And also we have the CMOS technology. So these are the most famous technology start to invent it uh, in the, around the 1964. And they are start to have many, many companies start to involve. And this moment start, we have the Japanese company start to rise. The Intel start to rise. Then Samsung start to rise. And, but however, the TI start to gradually decrease their market sharing at that moment. And the, the sixth one, which will be the memory technology. The memory technology, including, for example, the DRAM, and also the flash memory. So when we talk about flash, then it's for sure we need to talk about the Professor Simon C, so which is uh, Simon, and he is a professor also in the NYCU, and because he invented the the charge based floating gate memory, in general we call this as a flash memory. So there's also the another very classic uh, semiconductor textbook is called the, I think it's called the physics of semiconductor device, which is written by the Professor Simon C. And that's also a very nice book. But however, we don't use that one as a main reference because that one is even more like the dictionary. So they try to he try to cover the every a lot of aspect and sometimes I feel like that one is more uh, good for the reference for the tool book uh, rather than uh, be used for the, the lecture. Yes? Have you worked in TSMC before and I wonder how did you get this line? This is open talk. Oh, is this open talk? Yes. Not exactly. Everything is important. Yes. Okay, and then the seventh one. And then seventh one is about the assembly and test. So the assembly and test is generally we call this a Feng Zhuang and Ce Shi. So Right now, that uh, uh, not only the semiconductor is manufactured by the dedicated company, also has uh, some dedicated companies working on assembly and test. So right now, it's very professional 
a company they work on this and then therefore this can reduce the the cost burden for the the uh the company because if the one company want to do the everything by themselves and that will be the huge investment and also the cost and also the s1 is uh the microprocessor Microprocessor. So the in the nine nineteen seventy, uh, because of Intel start to heavily working on the microprocessors. As you may know that uh, when we start to use the personal computing, the most of the CPU actually is made by the Intel, and therefore that's why the Intel start to grab the market and start to become the main company in the industry. Yes. It's general, included everything, also the CPU. And also, uh, in the knife, the, the, this one, which will be the VLSI system. So the VLSI system is we start to make the very large system integration here and right now afterwards start has many many what we call the fabulous company. For example, more lots of the IC design company are the fabulous company and therefore they can purely focus on the circuit design and then the foundry can help them to start to manufacture their device here. And therefore the last important one which will be the the dedicated a uh, foundry business model. So since we have the 1984, 85, then we have a dedicated signage, uh, fun, a business model for the foundry, and therefore you can see that uh, the cooperation between the fabulous company for the IC design house and the manufacturing company, this become like a win-win solution. So they both benefit a lot with this, uh, the business model. So the IC design house, they only focus on the design and then the foundries will only focus on the fabrication and the manufacturing. Uh, yes? Uh, why did Micro not list it in the slide? Why have to be? Then you have to ask uh, Maurice. This is his point of view. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Okay. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the first uh, 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 First IC that are fabricated by the TI for the Jack Kelby that demonstrate the first IC. So the first IC is made by the germanium and then it's a single transistor. And it's uh, in the 1958, this is a single transistor and supporting component on list of the germanium. Okay, but later on we found that Germania is not very stable, especially if we want to have very high quality and stable dielectric, and therefore it's better to use a silicon dioxide. And that's why silicon becomes the main trend, because of we have very stable silicon dioxide as a insulator. Okay, and here is uh, the most famous law that I predict for the semiconductor technology is called the Morse law. So Morse law is observation that the, the number of the transistor of transistor in the integrated circuit actually will double approximately every two years here. So 
Therefore, based on his observation in the very early time, he already made that assumption that all of the 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 density for our circuit will be double every two years here. So this rule become like the golden rule for the semiconductor industry because every company will try to use this one as their roadmap, and then this also become not only for the technology purpose, but also for the economic purpose as well. So this is also later on we have always have this several rumors that the, about the Morse law will be dead or not. And therefore we start to have the different point of view about the Morse law. So later on, like this one is from the, the Professor Philip Wong, which is a Stanford professor. In the past, he already made some uh, analysis that uh, related to the relative density versus a different technology here. So this is a transistor density. That's only come for the microprocessor. But if you still look at for the yellow one, which is logic gate, and then the red one is high density SRAM. And also the green one is standard cell inverter. We can still see that all these the technology are still on the trend, pretty close, follow the Morse law. And then in order to make this uh, technology can pretty align with the Morse law, actually there's a several important concept and innovation in the past. In the early time, we have the Dinar scaling that's trying to make the everything equilibrium scaling as shown here. So for example, we just make the dielectric as a thinner. We just make our channel as a thinner. So you can see there's a factor here. This is called our channel over our alpha. So alpha is our scaling factor. So which means that every year we will scale. For example, if the alpha is two, that means uh, that every year we just make our channel as a smaller as a possible with the alpha factor of the two. But however, we found out that this is not possible for all the time because when we continue to the, do the scaling, we will start to reach the physical limitation. For example, once our gate outside becomes too thinner, <coughs> then we start to face many reliability issues here. And therefore, people start to think about the, how we call the equilibrium scaling. Equilibrium scaling, we start to consider as uh, so using the strength silicon and high K metal gate. And then in that case, we can achieve for the equilibrium scaling. We will also talk about that uh, uh, from the physics point of view, that what does it mean for the equilibrium scaling here. In here, just a general overview that uh, something turned that you will hear over and over again. And also, later on, we will have the FinFET technology that's mainly used for the channel scaling. And then later on, we have what we call the, the DTCO, the design technological optimization. So based on the DTCO, so we can start to further uh, make sure our technology can pretty closely follow the most law. But however, the dim dimensional scaling is actually under the pressure. You can see the trend is start to slow down here. So this is a 40 nanometer film fab. And then when we talk about five nanometer, we might start to consider what we call the nano Y. And then further, we might have the thing or nano Y, or right now we call about the nano ship and so on. So because of the, the technology limitation, so it's very difficult to continue to do the dimensional scaling. So here is a slide that only shows that, uh, that uh, how actually small for our film fade technology compared to with other stuff here. So you can see this is a size for the hydrogen oton and this is size for the water molecule, and this is size for the carbon nanotube. And right now, if we are considered the most advanced film fat, you can see that the size is already smaller than our virus here. So we are 
actually, uh, if you start to involve the semiconductor research, in, it's often that we try to make our device below like a 50 nanometer. So 50 nanometer is generally the, the, the size for the virus here. So right now the semiconductor technology or even the engineering is already moved to the beyond of the biological uh, limitation. So right now we are approached to the size below like a 50 nanometer. And the evolution of microelectronics, we are still talk about some old his history here. So this is uh, in the early stage when we don't have the transistor here. The first one we talk about, which is uh, the vacuum tube. And the second one, start from 1947, we start to have another one called the bipolar. So this is a one that I already mentioned. We will talk about all the BJT later, which is a bipolar transistor. And also we have another one called the MOSFET. So the MOSFET is already something we already talk about that, uh, why the name here is called the MOSFET because we have a metal outside field effect transistor here. And also the MOSFET actually has what we call the unipolar characteristic. Unipolar is what we call the Dan Xin, and which means the bipolar we have what we call this is bipolar characteristic is the Xuan Ji Xin. The 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 name meaning for the unipolar and the bipolar is means that uh, if we have only one carrier transport, is sometimes we consider this is a unipolar device. If we carrier carrier unipolar. And the reason why the MOSFET consider as a unipolar, this is because if we look at schematic for our MOSFET transistor, so we have the source here. This is what we say previously. We have a source drain. We have a p-type substrate. We have the dielectric. We have the gate. So when we apply the gate bias, So it's normally we will apply a certain voltage on our on our gate side. When we apply the gate bias, so it's easy to imagine that uh, you can start to attract some electron, right? You So that's a very basic fundamental physics. So therefore, if you apply the party gate bias, it's easily understood that uh, you will have a certain of the electrons negative charge will be attractive below our dielectric. So when you put a negative bias, you will be able to get But however, because we have the insulator here, so that means the charge attractive will be below our insulator and not possible to across this insulator, right? 因为我们这边有一个绝缘层，所以你再加一个正电压的时候，你的电子只会被吸引在这边，而不会跑过去。So that's a, actually that's a already if you can understand the characteristic, I can say you almost understand the MOSFET. So MOSFET just that the simple. So once we apply gate bias, we'll attract some electron here, and because we have the insulator, so this electron will not possible. To move to wall. But at the meantime, we will still apply a small drain bias here, still a positive. Again, you have a positive charge, a uh, positive bias. That means your electron will start to move to the right hand side, right? charge, So therefore, this electron will start to move 
to your drain side. In the end, become your drain current here. And that's why we have the this famous ID versus VG curve, right? So I hope right now you can still follow me. Once we apply gate bias at a certain enough, then you start to have a drain current because at this moment, VD, for example, is plus one volt. So this is our first time to explain roughly about the idea of the MOSFET, but uh, we will explain this for sure again and again. But if you can understand what I'm saying, this electron move to the drain side, become our drain current. If you can understand, then that means the MOSFET will become not the problem for you because that's already the essential physics, essential fundamentals for the MOSFET. And as I say, you can see the major carrier in the channel, this is our channel, Tong Dao. The major carrier in the channel is only the electron, which is only the one type of carrier. So that's why we call this as a unipolar, because there's a only one carrier transport. But in the bipolar transistor, we always have the two kinds of a carrier transport. We have electron and hole, and whether we will talk about later. Okay, so today, uh, this will be the last slide for the today class, and then I can show you some of the video that uh, we haven't finished this morning. But we can go from the beginning yeah, because there's a some student who come later. Well, if I had not made that prediction in 1965, I'm sure the industry would have just stopped growing and maybe collapsed. Now, realistically. Uh, I think the, the trend was built in. It would have happened with or without something called Moore's Law. It just may not have been quite so easy to uh, demonstrate with a curve or two what had happened. But uh, the genes that created the progress were already in place. Several people have impressed me. To pick a few, I'll start with my colleague, Dr. Bob Noyce and Dr. Andy Grove. Uh, they both had unique capabilities and were very important in the development of the industry, at least the part of it I was involved with. But then I look back at some of the original contributors, people like John Bardeen, uh, one of the quiet people in the early days of the industry that really made some of the first important contributions. I can't see any other technology where progress has been made at this rate for such a long period of time. It's the unique characteristics of the semiconductor industry. Making things smaller makes everything better simultaneously. It doesn't have the usual kind of trade-offs. The only trade-off is in the difficulty of executing the technology. But the products that come out are higher performance, cheaper, more reliable, all of the things you want. Uh, making steps from one technology node to the next is becoming increasingly difficult and more expensive. And I don't know how much longer it can continue. It would not surprise me at all if we kind of come to the end of scaling during this next decade. But I've been repeatedly surprised by the uh, ing ingenuity of the engineers and scientists in coming up with new ways to get around what look like insurmountable barriers. I think uh, the semiconductor industry is going to supply the intelligence for an increasingly intelligent uh, environment. 
The Internet of Things is just one example of where that's moving. And it just suggests that all of the pieces we have will be interconnected in some important way. Uh, I'm afraid I won't be a participant in that very much. Uh, the technology has kind of passed me by. Yeah, I've gotten far enough away from it. I have a tough time predicting what the major breakthroughs will be. And I look at my record of thinking of that in the past, and I have to admit I'm not very good at it. I miss the PC, I miss the importance of the internet, and I probably miss several other things I don't even know about. Uh, predicting major innovation is a tough job, and I'll leave that to someone else. Okay, so class will stop today and see you all the next Monday. Thank you.